families bless police officers on Christmas op duties. PM Marape appeals for forgiveness in Taripur electorate. And Joseph Style LLG needs help. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Sunday's news. In appreciating the work of police officers during this festive season, families in NCD are dropping off food and drinks at police checkpoints as a sign of saying thank you. Senior newspaper journalist Christine Pakakota and her family were amongst the kind-hearted who made Christmas more heartwarming for the team in blue. They visited offices on duty at the NCC roundabout and later stopped over at Burns Peak. These police officers are working into the night to ensure a safe and secure Christmas for NCD residents. Mrs. Pakakota, when serving lunch to these officers, said Christmas is a time for sharing and caring and her family chose to show their gratitude by feeding police personnel on duty on Christmas Day. This Christmas and New Year operation will end on the first week of January 2021. The Prime Minister spent Christmas in his Tari Pori electorate and while addressing a gathering at the Andaja Oval in Tari on Christmas Day, he called on the people of Tari Pori to use the power of forgiveness to heal their differences and start new lives. Christmas is always about remembering the birth of Christ and spending time with family and appreciating those close or dear to you. It's a day that falls six days before the new year, allowing families and friends to come together to reconcile and welcome the new year with a clean slate. Prime Minister James Marape emphasized this point of forgiveness and healing when addressing more than 1,000 people at the Andanja Oval in Tari on Christmas Day. Marape told them that the power of forgiveness healed souls to avoid hatred and resentment that could occur as a result of harboring differences. He encouraged them to forgive one another and not to hold on to differences. The Prime Minister also appealed to the Taripuri people to go into farming and small business activities to support their families as the national government would support the small to medium enterprises or SME sector. Two million kina has been put forward to support SMEs in the district. You less of school, no get money. You focus on making really business of less money for the district. They put them one million, one point five million kwanda. Governor, I'm talking about the five hundred thousand kwanda. How can I tell you for it? But plus, can you believe that long? Group people are stable. One on house line or council group people. Mama go stable. Mama group. Boys go stable. Boys group. The Prime Minister was accompanied by Minister for Labour and Employment and Liga Pogera MP Tomite Kapili, Transport Minister Ngolala MP William Saum, and Hela leaders led by businessmen Larry Andagali, Peterson PP and Pai Wasa. And as is PNG custom, he later paid a visit to the house cry or morning house of his longest serving Taripuri District Development Authority CEO, David Takitako, who passed away in Port Moresby recently. Shamin Porayamba of National MTV News. St. John has responded to 27 cases involving violence in the last two days between Christmas Eve and Boxing Day. Despite the vast number of people in the nation's capital and East New Britain celebrating the festive period in the safety of their homes, it was also disappointing that the ambulance service needed to attend to a large number of violence-related incidents most of which involved stabbings taking place in villages and on the streets. St. John is also calling for a focus on road safety this festive season, as the ambulance service has had to respond to 19 serious cases involving motor vehicles since the 1st of December. Motorists and passengers are urged to slow down, drive according to road conditions, and wear seat belts at all times. These are safety measures that will decrease the chance of more fatal accidents this festive season. It is encouraging to see perpetrators of gender-based violence and domestic violence seek counselling services. In recent years, the Wanto Counselling Help in Line has received many calls from men, particularly perpetrators. We 
have... Um... Since the establishment in 2015, the number of people seeking counselling through the Wanto Counselling Helping Line has gradually increased. From 2015 to 2019, over 40,000 calls have been recorded. In 2019, about 2,000 callers were genuine callers seeking advice on referral pathways or what they can do to address gender-based violence at their communities and homes. Surprisingly, over 50 percent of the callers were males with over 50 percent of the callers being male male callers generally call for information and have had a small number of perpetrators call uh, men have higher phone ownership as validated in the recent survey a third of the callers each month are due to intimate partner violence, indicating that so much more still needs to be done to address domestic violence issues. So the most uh, presenting issues that we receive for the helpline is intimate partner violence, family violence and relationship issues. While the Wanto Counseling Helping Line has been reared mainly towards assisting women and children and the marginalized population in communities who continue to face some form of violence, in recent times, the counseling service has been receiving a lot of calls from perpetrators, something which is encouraging. Uh, perpetrators calling in, they're seeking advice on how they can help their families and we see that it's uh, a privilege to assist men to learn more about the services available and also how they can help themselves to help their families. You know, we see that as a huge opportunity for prevention because if somebody has the courage to call and they've done something bad to somebody else, the fact that they've called is an opportunity. And so what we're saying there is, you know, then if we can help avoid that happening again and minimize the likelihood of it being repeated, that's really a very positive um, situation. The One Talk Counseling Helping Line is a toll-free service, meaning you don't need credits to call and all information is kept confidential. More men are encouraged to call the service. The number is 71508000. The counselling is very tailored to the particular situation and experience of each person and what will really work best for them. The service is currently supported by Child Fund and the Consultative Implementation and Monitoring Council or CIMC. The counselling service runs 24 hours a day. Shamin Poreambeb, National MTV News. Police in Manos have reported one death prior to Christmas Day and the wounding of a man from East Sipic who tried to attack police officers who apprehended him for drinking in public. The wounded man is receiving medical treatment at Larangal General Hospital and once discharged, he will be arrested by police. Manos Police Commander Chief Inspector David Yapu said apart from minor arrests on individuals who consumed homebrew, Christmas was celebrated peacefully on the island province. PPC Yapu has thanked locals in Manus and acknowledged the work of police officers during the Christmas and New Year operations. Prime Minister James Marape is encouraging local entrepreneurs to engage in small businesses in the new year. The Prime Minister, in his Christmas message to the nation, says his government is committed to assisting local farmers grow their business in the SME sector. The focus of the Marape government is on helping to develop the SME sector in PNG. This has been outlined through the Prime Minister's Christmas message when he announced his government will draw support from financial institutions. And starting with the smallest business in the micro space to the small, medium and large businesses. We ask him about opening against this Christmas. Sit back. Think about what business you can make him. Suppose you want money, finish long public service now. No can finish him, finish payable you. Long one talk, na tribe, na party, na cancer. Migrate that finish pay into the space of SME. 
The SME sector remains the largest employer of 80% of the total population of PNG. It is an important area of development and ranges from cash crop farming to cattle breeding. Only recently, local farmers are starting to plant and harvest rice and enter into inland fishing. These SME programs are supported by various agricultural agencies, including the National Fisheries Authority. You mean I can sit back and wait for the government? Me the government will work to make sure that all government, all no can come inside long all business where you yet can make him no can. But time you mean I work him? But how about you let them just like vacuum the business space? And so not like keen interest for me as your Prime Minister and as head, head of this government, we've been so talked to plenty long SME space. With more focus to be on developing the SME sector, the Small and Medium Enterprises Corporation, or SMEC, is expected to take the lead. Being the authorized agency responsible to upskill training of local farmers and assist those in the informal sector, access financial support, the new chairman is committed to the growth of the sector. But the ones that will be most important to us will be the actual Papua New Guinean SMEs that we decide to work with. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. Our provincial administrator Trevor Magay has appealed to all public servants in the province to work together in 2021 for a better oro. In his New Year message to his staff, he says he will be exercising his full powers as the provincial administrator come 2021. He also appealed to all public servants to celebrate peacefully with families this festive season. By next year, we'll be moving forward. Next year, um, we've been waiting for three years now. Uh, now in May, uh, as the permanent administrator, the, whole, the entire ball game will change by next year. I will, I will be requesting for everybody to perform. Uh, I will be now exercising my full powers uh, coming next year, so I expect everybody to pull their socks up and let's work together and try and change this province. You're watching National MTV News. We'll bring you stories making headlines overseas after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas left looking like a war zone, the southern U.S. city of Nashville is rocked by a huge blast on Christmas morning. What are believed to be human remains have been found nearby. Three people injured and at least 40 buildings damaged. The FBI is now hunting those behind the attack. A chilling Christmas morning message in Nashville, Tennessee. Residents scrambled out of their homes before... Those who didn't make it out in time captured the aftermath. Homes destroyed. The RV exploded at 6.30 this morning. We do believe this to have been an intentional act. Uh, significant damage has been done to the infrastructure there on 2nd Avenue North. Police were responding to reports of gunfire when they came across this motorhome playing a recorded message, a countdown to a bomb explosion caught on CCTV in this apartment. Three people were injured, including a police officer who was directing people away from the area. Uh, there was actually a man walking his dog on 2nd Avenue that an officer stopped and directed in a, uh, another way just before the RV exploded. Uh, the explosion knocked one of our officers to the ground. Investigators can't confirm whether anyone was in the vehicle, but possible human remains were found near the site this morning. We have not received any threats whatsoever. Uh, it was total, total surprise. I don't want to speculate, but you, you would think that uh, this person didn't want to harm people, that maybe just wanted to 
uh, destroy. Second Avenue is one of the busiest streets in downtown. Kiwi Jade Ford visits frequently. It you know, feels scary. Yeah, you, you know, you see this on the news and everything like that, but when it's in your hometown, it's just like, okay, this is just way too close. And a lot of people are sad and upset and confused, um, you know, and it's Christmas Day too, so, you know. How can this be happening on Christmas? Please tell us what you know. We need your leads, we need your help. The FBI is asking for sightings of the motorhome, which arrived on 2nd Avenue after 1 a.m. on Christmas Day. as they investigate a cruel act that deafened the music city. A new strain of coronavirus is causing concern in the United States with experts saying they believe it's likely to be already circulating. On average, two Americans per minute are dying from COVID-19. Christmas cheer, not the only thing spreading in the United States. With more than two Americans testing positive for COVID every second. California alone surpassing two million infections, more than most countries. This emergency is our darkest day. Maybe the darkest day in our city's history. Hospital staff are still grappling with infections triggered by Thanksgiving travel, scared of what's ahead. Every day I see, I look into the eyes of someone who's struggling to breathe, um, who's struggling to, you know, get well. They want to be home with their family. Concern too about the new strain of virus sweeping parts of England. These variants are going to lead to more people getting infected, more people getting hospitalised, uh, unfortunately more people dying. For some, nothing Nothing is getting in the way of their right to tradition. This church welcoming worshippers on Christmas Eve, one of the few allowing people inside. If you think this world is it, right, and you're gone and you're done after this, then everything about protecting this moment in this life is everything. God knows when I'm going to die and um, I don't fear death. There is light in the darkness too. This ICU nurse has been fighting the virus herself for eight months. Now she's home for Christmas. Just fight, fight, because look at me, you know, I'm going home and I'm walking. In Chicago, Joe Bruno's parents were both killed by COVID this month. He has a desperate plea for the rest of the country. Cancel your flights, cancel your plans, stay home. It hurts so bad. And if I could go back in time, I would do things differently. Start the clock. In around two weeks, we'll know if Americans have heeded that advice. They are the unwelcome guests of summer, making themselves felt at campsites and barbecues and interrupting sleep. But now there is concern the native species of mosquitoes might need a helping hand. It's the sound of summer no one likes to hear. But next time you feel their bite, Tapapa's hoping you'll get some revenge and help them out with the National Mosquito Census. I just want to help their reputation. If people think of mosquitoes, they think they are nuisance biters, but I want to show that they are actually very important pollinators. They are important for the food chain, the larvae, um, clean our waters. Dr Casper's passionate about mozzies. I also used to have a rearing of larvae and adults and to feed them I had to put my hand in the rearing cage here yeah, to so to make sure they get enough blood. Especially our 13 native species. Some of those species are so um, under-researched, we don't know actually at all what they feed on. The aim of the census is to help fill those gaps, see if they're in decline and if introduced mosquitoes are taking over. From the beach to the bush, city and farm, specimens are needed from everywhere. It's best to freeze them to death to preserve their markings and postage is free, just make sure it's in a container. Some people have put the mosquito just in the envelope. Um, and then I just got a few legs when I unpacked it. Siobhan Barnard's already taken part. If we learn more about them and their contribution to our ecosystem, then we, we probably get to appreciate them more, I think. And she has some tips for first-time hunters. When they're not in a weird, sporadic mood and you want to wait for them and just very gently pop the container over and they might fly up to the top of the lid and when you do that you want to slip the lid together and just pull it tight together and you've, you've got your specimen. A chance to contribute to science 
and get even. One of New Zealand's most ambitious pest eradication projects is stepping up a notch. Conservations are working to eliminate all predators from Stewart Island, Rakiura, hoping to repeat the success of nearby Ulava Island. Off Stewart Island, Rakiura's mainland lies the country's southernmost bird sanctuary. This is our rarest bird. Tourists are flocking to Olva Island, experiencing nature at its best. It's unique. We don't have uh, mice, rabbits, goats, pigs, stoats or ferrets. So we work very hard at being predator free. The sound of native birds a testament to years of work, first becoming rat free in the late 90s. There are 75 tracking tunnels across the island, all loaded with the pest's favourite snacks. Six crunchy peanut butter is the... Um the recommended one, alongside traps, rodent dogs, sometimes cameras, uh, little wax tags, all sorts. Taking lessons from here to a size we've never seen before. It's a massive task and, uh, and it's one of those ones that um, when you start thinking about it, it's almost where do you start. To give you an idea on scale, Maria Island off the coast of Auckland at a mere one hectare became the first predator-free island in the 60s. The size of the island's increasing substantially over five decades, now reaching the ambitious 175,000 hectares on Stewart Island Rakiura's mainland. So there's um, multiple different types of terrain and all sorts. We've got industry here, we've got a resident population. Um, so all of those things are unique challenges. Challenges. The work is more than just getting the pesky pests off. Once the total eradication of this island is completed, then becomes the even harder work, and that is to keep those, uh, those pests off Rakiura. The Department of Conservation has committed up to $5 million over the next five years to come up with a plan to make Stewart Island predator free. If that's successful, those ideas could be used for the rest of the country. If the country is true with their 2050 vision, we've got a great area to start there, that, uh, that on in a real sense. By keeping our native species in the spotlight and roaming our native landscapes for years to come. You're watching National MTV News. When we return, we'll bring you this Sunday's A Closer Look. Don't go away. Welcome back. The Joseph Stahl local level government area in Medang province is a classic example of government neglect. For the last 30 years, the services have been allowed to deteriorate so much that the only road they had is now overgrown with bush. The airstrip is closed and the only way to get there is to walk for two days through thick jungle. Between 2013 and 2015, the Catholic Archdiocese spent more than three million to rehabilitate the health infrastructure in the station with the understanding that the government would take over when the project was completed. The MOU has not been signed yet. Government services have remained suspended and the people continue to suffer. I'm looking for some administrative. Big plus something now. Let me ask him this is a triple man or some governor, Peter Yama, a president, Arnold Warangima, na open member, blow me plus, middle ramu. Tight him, walk, boom, na bring him this is a roti come inside, na by you bring him. Walk money come inside, na service two by come, na me plus people blow here by benefit. Big plus something, concern from plus, I'm rota so. Little business from plus, sleep nothing stuff. Cacao stop, boy stop, money from the ready tasso, one em road blow me blah, move him this little hunting a piney money blow me. For an outsider, it's difficult to comprehend the hardships that the people of Joseph Stahl go through every day. Time has to be close, 20 years now. Na roti pass, service, now me find him. From a functioning station in the 1970s and 80s, Joseph Stahl is now a shadow of its former self. Much of the infrastructure built during a time when vehicles could travel here are vacant. The two-day trek and unreliable transport is something families don't want to encounter. We planted something in Ohrite. Planted something in Ohrite, long time. Living long, people are stable in long place. So I'm going to look at myself. Planted side, me block long pine. Planted pen too much long. Travel, travel. Come, come on, same. This side long, same car. Now make him on the road, something on same. We block on a position, came on. Plan to a political line, only go. 
After two months of political instability in Waigani, where millions of Kina were spent so generously on hire cars, hotel bills, food, entertainment, and promises of big projects, just seeing the people of Joseph Stahl suffer because of 30 years of government neglect will make you angry. The only road that used to connect Joseph Stahl to Medang is now overgrown with bush. And this is the airstrip. Many of the older kids can't remember the last time a plane brought in supplies. When you travel to Joseph Stahl, you get to understand the difficulties the people face. And the first thing that confronts you is the uncertainty of transportation. Unless you have everything pre-arranged, you really don't know when the next vehicle will come to the drop-off point or when the next boat will take you up river to where the trek to Joseph Stahl begins. And travel is hard for families with small children. Making this journey gives you an appreciation of why government workers don't find Joseph Stahl an attractive career prospect. <laughs> Church health workers like Patrick Angrai have to go through this at the beginning of the year and then every quarter when they have to pick up medical supplies in Medang. If a boat doesn't come, they have to wait for it. Suppose no boat, remember me for sleep lawyer because me for no all one talk or some right out where me for stop you man. I'm not a player now now. Me for sexy time. I'm planning to me for facing this baby. The two-day trek to Joseph Stahl goes through thick jungle and sago swamps. Textbooks, medical supplies, food and building materials are carried on foot along this trek. At Joseph Stahl, many of the people have given up hope. They've become so used to the neglect that they've tried their best to adapt. But it's hard to ignore the hundreds of school children whose opportunities for education have been cut short by the ongoing government neglect. And your guys sports is next. Huxley Lovai will be back with some sporting action. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. Group H playoff in the NCD Governors Cup saw Seals defeat the Garakoni Dogs four points to two at the Sir William Skate Oval in Calgary. Seals will now progress to the finals. Seals and uh, Garakoni Dogs. So they are both tied on the same percentage and the points. So the loser of this team bows out and the winner qualifies to their second place to qualify for the finals. Playoffs which will start tomorrow, tomorrow and Tuesday. The grand finals will be on Wednesday. So hopefully they are only doing a playoff for, for one of them to qualify into, the, into their pool. We'll have more sporting action for you on the other side of this break. Stay with us. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. The Will Blacks are hoping to shock the world as they line up in next year's rescheduled Paralympics in Tokyo. They are set to be involved for the first time since 2008, and the volunteer driven sport has had to overcome many obstacles to return to the pinnacle event. They train just as hard as they play. And the goal for Wheel Blacks co-captain Cody Everson is just as clear-cut. The goal for the Wheel Blacks is to definitely go there and win. Team have only recently returned to training, the COVID-19 threat posing a greater danger to this group than most. For us in shares, it could affect our immune system and everything, so there was definitely a at home. Just competing at the Paralympics. 
2012 in Rio four years ago. And dual para-athlete Cameron Leslie believes the lack of funding might be why. From a, in my world, you come from a well-funded para-swimming program to a volunteer-driven sport in wheelchair rugby and expectations totally different. The but they also have to factor in a team mechanic, carers and space for all their equipment. And they face sides like England and Australia who pour money into the sport. I think if we had more money to be able to meet up more or have the facilities, have the people around us, it would be amazing. $5,000 a person per tournament sometimes, if you're taking 16, 17 people, it adds up really fast. But obstacles are nothing new for these athletes. Yeah, challenges is definitely something that um, myself and the whole team have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And although they're going in as the underdogs, the Wheel Blacks have a determination to ensure nothing stands in their way. I've got a good feeling, like I do, I feel like, you know, who knows, we can shock the world and, and beat an Aussie. All have gone down the road of recovery, but now they're on the road to Tokyo. Ross Taylor and Ken Williamson added new records to their resumes yesterday at the Bay Oval as Mount Ganui turned on a stunner on its first Boxing Day test. Despite a solid enough looking scorecard, the Black Caps know that they're in for the toughest test series of the summer. A picture perfect day at the Mount, just not the perfect start for the Black Caps. Go to gone! That one doesn't go on the gap, it goes straight to third slip. Pakistan winning the toss, their bowlers licking their lips on a green surface. Edged and taken! Nice pair of hands, it's that man Shaheen! Shaheen Shah Afridi sending both openers back cheaply, but that only brought Captain Kane Williamson and Ross Taylor together at the crease. Oh, he's off the mark. He's off the mark with the boundary four. Nice piece of timing off his pads. Today, a milestone test for Taylor. Passing Daniel Vittori for the most appearances across all formats, this his 438th match. <laughs> Let's cut away again. A few loose deliveries aside, the Black Caps under plenty of pressure. Williamson even given a rare reprieve. Edged. Did a carry and might have carried. It was very close. Good. Yeah, you can see a half chance. Half chance is often as close as you get to Williamson's wicket. Driving. At times, paint's drying quicker than runs being scored at Bay Oval. Taylor's 50, the second slowest of his career, the captain taking 154 balls to reach his. Oh, pulled away, pulled away for four. Kane Williamson's been waiting for that, waiting for a long time. For Williamson, he pulls alongside Stephen Fleming for the most innings past 50, a record equaling 55th time. Another fantastic innings. But full credit to the visitors' perseverance, with their 20-year-old danger man eventually getting the breakthrough. Oh, that's close, is it out? Yes, Taylor Ward. He set him up. Unfortunately, the bowlers not finding much help from their fielders. <laughs> it was a tired old effort. Williamson, the new dad, remember, showing no sign of fatigue. Emphatic fashion. The Black Caps in control, but Pakistan certainly up for the Bay Oval battle. You're watching National MTV News. Helen will be back with the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. True Kai Sport. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast in the southern region. Possible rain showers and thunder tonight and fine. Partly cloudy morning in Port Moresby. Light rain drizzles tonight and cloudy morning in Daru. Light rain drizzles tonight and a cloudy morning as well in Popondetta. Light showers and drizzles tonight, then a fine partly cloudy morning in Kerma. And mostly fine though partly cloudy tonight and tomorrow in Alutau. In the Mamasa region, cloudy with some rain showers and drizzles tonight and tomorrow in Leh. Partly cloudy tonight with morning shower or two in Medang. Partly cloudy tonight with morning shower or two as well in Wewak and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine though partly cloudy tonight in Lorengau and KVN. Fine although partly cloudy tonight and tomorrow in Kokopo and Rabaul. 
Light showers and drizzles tonight, then fine morning in Kimbe and light thundery showers tonight and a cloudy morning in Buka. And in the Highlands region, summer rain showers tonight with morning fog in Mount Hagen. Light rain drizzles tonight, then morning fog in Goroka and Kundiawa. And rain drizzles tonight, then morning fog in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's been the news, sport and weather for today, the 27th of December 2020. On behalf of the entire MTV News team right around the country, pleasant viewing. Good night.